Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our call today. Uh, this call is regarding our most recent report on the EIM resource sufficiency evaluation in the energy imbalance market uh, for October, which was published last Friday, November 12th. Um, throughout the presentation, we'll stop for questions. The purpose, the whole purpose of holding this call, which we are holding actually at a market participant request, is to have uh, questions and discussions and to get your, get your feedback. So please do utilize the raise hand feature in WebEx. Um, if you connected only by phone, you can press pound two on the phone for audio um, for people who are only connected by phone. Please do remember to state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Um, you may also use the chat feature in the WebEx as well. Um, the report, um, as well as data underlying some of our metrics, is available on the ISO website on DMM's webpage, um, and links are provided throughout the presentation. Calls and webinars are recorded for stakeholder convenience, allowing those who are unable to attend to listen to the recordings after the meeting. The recordings will be publicly available on the ISO webpage for a limited time following the meetings. The recordings and any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenter today, Kyle Westender. Thank you, Kyle. Hello, welcome everyone. This is Kyle Westendorf. I'm an analyst with DMM. Um, so let me get to the next slide here. So like Amelia said, we've, since our last presentation, we've released two reports, a September report that we released last month and a October report that we published last Friday. In these reports, we have two new special sections. The first looks at net load uncertainty. Um, which is used in the test. And then the second is a, a comparison between unloaded capacity and net EIM imports. After that, we'll take a look at some of the new metric updates and additions um, that we put in for the October report. And then we'll also talk about some of the uh, underlying interval level data that we're providing. So with that, let's jump to a net load uncertainty. So I want to start with where net load uncertainty, which is used in both the capacity and the flexible ramping sufficiency test, where that uncertainty comes from. And it's actually pulled from the 15-minute market flexible ramping product uncertainty calculation. So right here in this chart, we're looking at a sample two-hour period. And if we go to the top here, we have a 15-minute market run. So we have the start time of that 15-minute market run by this black dot. And that will pull net load for a binding interval as well as future advisory intervals. The uncertainty calculation, the current one, it uses the net load from the first advisory interval. So that's your predicted net load and it compares that to three corresponding five-minute market intervals for the actual net load. And from that comparison, it comes up with a distribution of errors. So what I'm showing by this dotted blue line here going out is the time difference between that prediction and the actual. So really, the, the current uncertainty construct is capturing 45 to 55 minutes of potential uncertainty that might materialize. Now, if, it's, if we go to the resource sufficiency evaluation, pan to the bottom, the um, RRC pulls VR and load forecasts 55, minute 55 minutes prior to the hour, and it's made up of four 15-minute intervals. In the first 15-minute interval, if we compare that, that first test interval, if we compare that to the three corresponding five-minute market intervals, you can get a sense of that time horizon for that first interval. So for the first test interval, the uncertainty that it's really capturing is pretty similar to what's 
already calculated based off of the 15-minute market uncertainty from the flexible ramping product. So that's comparing this like dotted green line, that length, to the uh, dotted blue. But as we move to the later test intervals, interval two, three, and four, that gap widens. Um, so it's reaching over 100 minutes between um, the prediction for the resource efficiency evaluation and maybe actuals based off of the five-minute market. So now, as, a, as part of the FlexRamp product real-time refinement stakeholder initiative, that uncertainty is expected to change. Um, it's going to better account for uh, load and renewable forecasts currently in this, on the system. Um, but my point with this chart um, is really that uncertainty that's used in the resource efficiency evaluation uh, should be developed separately from that of the flexible ramping product, which is really a, a different time horizon. Next, I want to move on to some of the new metrics that we put in the October report for net load uncertainty. So I'll show three metrics here. Um, and we publish these three metrics in the report for every EIM entity, so definitely check that out. Um, the first one, we're just using the, the California ISO as an example. It's looking at the current source of uncertainty. So this top line is the average upward uncertainty from the 97.5th percentile of net load error observations. And the bottom line is the average downward uncertainty used in the test based off of the 2.5th percentile of net load error observations. And then you can see from the bars what's contributing to that uncertainty, whether it's load error, solar error, or wind error. One note on these metrics, um, you'll see there, I have two lines here, one for measured uncertainty, and then one for the resource efficiency evaluation uncertainty. The measured uncertainty um, is exactly from, is like the raw uncertainty straight, straight from the uh, net load error observations. Um, but in the resource efficiency evaluation, those raw values can be capped by what are called thresholds and then also rounded. Um, the uncertainty thresholds are designed to help, they're based off of a larger confidence interval over a long, longer time period, and they're designed to prevent extreme outlier or erroneous net loader observations from flowing into the calculation and setting uncertainty. Um, so in, in this metric, you'll sometimes see differences between the, the blue line and the red line. Um, and that's mostly from the, the caps being applied. So you'll, you'll see that sometimes on some of these higher uh, regions. The next metric um, that we have um, compares net load in the bid range capacity test and those used in the five minute market. So we're looking at a distribution of those uh, errors between the, you know, the test and the five minute market. So higher net load error, um, like we see here in our ending nine, that reflects either higher load or lower renewables in the five minute market relative to the test. And then in comparison, we have in the red lines, the actual upward and downward uncertainty which was used as an input in the resource efficiency evaluation. Uh, so this measure just gives a sense of how well the uh, current construct of uncertainty uh, fits around what you might think of as uh, actual net load error between the test and the five minute market. And if we go to the next metric, the last one I have here for uncertainty, it's the exact same idea, but I'm splitting out the error into both the load error and the renewable error from the uh, variable energy resources. 
in a future report, I would like to split out the VER air into wind and solar, which I think would be helpful for, for stakeholders. Um, but in the meantime, let me pause here and see if there's any questions on any of the new uncertainty metrics or anything I just presented. Um, looks like we do have a question in queue. All right, let me go ahead and unmute the line. Michelle, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hey, this is Michelle. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, are these bar and whiskers quartiles? So do they represent, does the bar represent a quartile and the other um, line re represent a quartile as well? Or am I misreading this? Yeah, exactly. The distribution, it's just a very simple interquartile range um, for the upper and, and lower ends of the whiskers. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, we're moving to the next caller. Daniel, your line is on. You may go ahead. Thanks. Hi, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. Um, first, thank you for doing the presentation and for putting together the very detailed report. There's a lot of information in there to comb through, but uh, seems like it's all very good things. Um, I guess the question that I have is that, and I'm not sure who is on from the CAISO, but just whether you've uh, – gotten any reactions on the comparison of the uncertainty calculation to the time frame of the RSE, just kind of that that section of your report? Um, you know, I imagine that things were set up the way that they were initially uh, out of a feasibility perspective, or um, you know, has it made sense to do it that way? And I'm just curious if, if Kaiso has had any thoughts or discussion about um, you know, changes in this area or whether they see it as potentially problematic or, or not. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think anyone is on the panel right now from the ISO side. Um, I expect we might have um, at least one person joining us maybe later in the presentation that we could either uh, re-ask the question or I could uh, pass it over to them um, after the call. Okay, I suppose we could also just bring it up. I know there's a RSE uh, evaluation meeting on December 14th coming up, so I suppose we could talk about it there as well. So I'll just reiterate, thank you for putting all this data together and uh, giving us something to look at. All right, thanks for joining us today. All right, there are no additional questions in queue. Okay. Um, let me move to the next section here. All right, so this section was first added in the September report, and we have it again in the October report. It's a comparison between unloaded capacity and net EIM imports. The example here covers the peak load hours on a single day, uh, the peak load hours on July 9th, um, which was a period in which the ISO hit a stage two energy emergency. Um, but really this example highlights the, the differences we're seeing for, for any interval. Um, so let me start with the blue line. Um, it's the actual incremental bid-in capacity or unloaded capacity, which was used in the bid range capacity test to meet imbalance requirements. The red bar shows those imbalance requirements, um, and that includes any inner tie or net load uncertainty. And then the yellow bars are same requirement, but without any of the uncertainty components. So in other words, the yellow bar is the test perspective prior to adding any uncertainty for the amount needed to overcome to balance internal supply without EIM imports. So that's the goal of the test. Now, the green bars show advisory net EIM imports in the 15-minute market. So we're looking at the latest results available at the time of the resource efficiency evaluation. Since these net EIM imports were used in the market to balance supply and demand internally in, in the ISO, 
another way to think of these green bars is as the market perspective for the amount needed to replace to balance internal supply without EIM transfers. Okay, so I, th I think you can see where I'm getting at. We're drawing a comparison between the advisory net EIM imports and the yellow bars, which is the uh, requirement without, insert without the uncertainty components. So they're based essentially measuring the same thing, which is energy imbalance without EIM transfers, but from two different perspectives. You have the resource efficiency evaluation perspective and the real-time market perspective. So I imagine the next question is, why are these two perspectives different? And that has to do with different inputs between those used in the test and the resource efficiency evaluation and then those inputs in the real-time market. So in the report, we have a list summarizing some of those input differences. The key difference is operator and balance conformance adjustments, which are included in the market optimization as changes in load, but are not included in the bid range capacity tests. Um, in the report, um, definitely check that out. There is a full list um, of some of the other input differences we've identified, which I hope sheds some light on, on some of the other input differences between the test and in the real-time market. Um, but I wanna end on one final point, um, and that's so we're not saying that these two perspectives, the test and the real-time market need to be identical. Um, and that includes the, the treatment of imbalance conformance adjustments, as well as some of the other input differences were identified. What we're trying to do here is to provide some transparency surrounding these differences um, so that they can better be discussed in the stakeholder process. So with this metric in particular, I know there's been a lot of um, discussion around it, surrounding it in the uh, stakeholder process. So I wanna pause here and, and again, see if there's any uh, questions online. We do have questions in queue. Okay. Michelle, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Yeah, this is Michelle. Just a couple of questions. Um, are you? Does this um, chart tell you that you're leaning more on the EIM than the unloaded capacity? That's sort of the first thing. I'm just trying to understand, and then I have an observation. Yeah, so to answer that, I think some stakeholders have looked at the unloaded capacity, and they're seeing the net EIM imports exceeding that unloaded capacity in some interval, and they're pointing to that as a sign that in, we're leaning on EIM, the ISO is leaning on, e, on EIM to balance internal supply and demand um, because the unloaded capacity is less than that. And I think the point to take away from, from this metric um, is that there's two different perspectives. Um, there's different inputs in the resource efficiency evaluation than those in the real-time market which output these EIM imports. Mm -hmm. um, so from the test perspective, um, which doesn't have imbalanced conformance adjustments or some of the other uh, components we've identified, passing the test, which is everything outside of this orange region, um, is just an indication that the ISO had sufficient bid at range capacity or unloaded capacity to, um, to meet that imbalance um, from from the test perspective. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I guess, you know, the thing is, I've also been looking really closely at July 9th and definitely the, uh, you know, you've, you've highlighted the time where we failed the bid range capacity test. But um, I also was looking at the exports during that time. So if you look at the exports, you know, that came out of RUC, so on the, on the 8th, um, the RUC said basically don't export anything. Those all got rebid. And during the times that we were failing, we weren't cutting those exports. So if you sufficiently cut the exports, you wouldn't fail the EIM sufficiency test, right? So for the RSC, the requirement's gonna look at any imports or exports in the real-time market um, prior to the test. So to the extent that there was cuts or, or lack of cuts at the in the real time market in those advisory intervals for the for the timing of the test, um, that would be factored into the requirement. 
Right. But if you didn't actually do the cuts, even though you did it in Ruck, and even though you were entering in stage two and stage three, that would make you resource insufficient, right? If you didn't actually make the cuts. Right. I see what you're saying. If those exports materialize in the real time market and 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 push the uh, the requirement up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that interaction makes sense to me. Okay, I guess I'm just struggling with that because, I mean, part of the reason that we didn't export was that um, I just, uh, on that day, the there was a timing issue, right? That was part of the issue. But the second issue is that I guess the operators started, thought that they were getting the imports but didn't, and then cut them. And then uh, in real time, if you cut the imports but you don't cut the exports, you're, you are going to have a problem, right? I mean, Right. Exactly. I mean, it's just a it's just a snapshot from the from a real time perspective um, on what the market sees at, at that time. Um, so whether or not that's a, a disconnect, um, that that would be okay. a, a separate separate item. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the question. We're moving on to the next question in queue. Dan, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hi, Dan from Customized Energy Solutions again. Um, that line of uh, questions and such with Michelle was really helpful too. I, I was just curious if when I'm looking at these, should we be thinking also about any changes in like the intertemporal constraints that um, ICE was considering? Does that play into at all the unloaded capacity uh, calculation? Yeah, exactly. So right now, if we're showing like a full unloaded capacity as it is today, which is just essentially just going all the way up to Pmax, um, accounting for any D rates, um, that's the blue line. And if the actual availability of those resources, um, because of resource constraints, um, would make the, the blue line um, even lower. So yeah, that, that, that would be a separate item. Uh, and then I guess maybe in the opposite direction, is there anything that we need to think about as far as the timing for the HASP market and you know, potentially um, additional economy energy that was available as bid, and not necessarily saying on July 9th, but just in general that was you know bid in but not selected out of the HASP market and how that may factor into the quantity of unloaded capacity that's available in the in the market? So non-EIM right. imports, I guess, is what I'm saying, that maybe could have been scheduled in the HASP but weren't. Are, are we strictly talking about um, uh, imports and exports, not generation? Uh, just to get to the unloaded capacity figure, like if uh, I'm trying to link this over to some of the so discussions the, we had in the MPPF around, like, the trade-off between, um, you know, making that decision of, of what gets scheduled and whether – it would have been possible to, instead of relying on the EIM imports, to maybe have scheduled additional HASP imports from non-EIM transfers to yeah. so get to the Yeah, so for the unloaded solution. capacity, it's primarily um, internal generation. Um, to the extent that there's 15-minute dispatchable imports and exports, which is a pretty small portion of, of ISO's uh, you know, import and export bids, um, that can be considered and included in unloaded capacity, um, but otherwise it's it's not considered uh, accessible or, or flexible in the real-time market um, time frame. So I would say that the majority of the unloaded capacity we're showing here is internal generation. Uh, and, and I guess what I'm trying to get out there, and maybe I'm not being very clear, is when um, – when the Kaiser reported on some of the summer market outcomes, they tended to show that uh, you know, most of the time um, all of the demand was covered by RA resources and that uh, even then when you start stacking on like above RA energy that there was you know, sufficient supply to cover that demand. And I'm just curious if, if some of the uh, issue here of not having enough unloaded capacity maybe to cover the EIM imports is that trade-off between – uh, imports that weren't, even if they're hourly block scheduled imports that weren't scheduled in HASP, that um, you know, then uh, it prevented 
some of that unloaded capacity from being available? Like if they would have scheduled in more HASP imports, would that have freed up more internal capacity that would have shown as unloaded capacity in, in this scenario? Yeah, I, I see your point now. Um, yeah, that interaction makes sense to me. It's, it's essentially the internal imports um, scheduled in hourly blocks through HASP would potentially replace um, um, internal generation, which frees up more headroom for um, unloaded capacity. I guess I'll, I'll just say I look forward to digging into this more, I guess, in yeah, the, in the resource efficiency. It uh, it, there's just so many things to think about in that it's not, it appears it's between Michelle's questions and some of this, it appears it's not maybe not as simple or as, as straightforward as, uh, as it looks on its face. Sure. Yeah, hey, you know, hey, this is Derek. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Eric. Yeah, yeah, just a comment because this has come up several times. So, yeah, we're so in the, the monthly reports, you know, we're we're getting these metrics out there. Um, uh, as Kyle mentioned, you know, this was an issue that was identified in the stakeholder process. Um, that, you know, the comparison is not, I mean, it is what it is. It's not straightforward. There's a lot of dynamics going on in the market uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how, you know, this snapshot in time, how this happens. Um, and you've mentioned, you know, numerous ones. Um, so we really, you know, in these reports, want to just tee up and get information out to stakeholders so that can then feed into the stakeholder process. Um, and as far as, you know, for instance, the, you know, uh, any discussion about the implications for the, the rules, I, I think is more appropriate as part of the stakeholder process. So we just want to get these metrics and data out there and answer any questions on them uh, you know, on these calls. Yeah, Eric, thank you. And I, I really want to emphasize yeah. the support for the reporting that DMM has been doing on this and the metrics that you're publishing. It's excellent data. Yeah. I, I guess where I'm going with it is just to say, I, I hope that time gets reserved in the stakeholder process to dig into this uh, in, in more depth and, you know, get the full yeah. perspective from the CAISO on, on this as well. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. We agree. Thank you. That's all. Thanks again. All right, I do not see any additional questions in queue at this time. Okay, uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, let's, um, we'll go into our next section, which is uh, looking at some of the new metrics and changes that we did in the, in the latest report. Um, so we're starting with the EIM transfer limits after a, a test failure. Uh, go to the, this slide here. This is a new metric showing the source of the imposed import limits following a test failure. Um, so remember that after there's a uh, bid range capacity or flexible ramping sufficiency test failure, um, the imports um, will be limited to the greater of the base transfer or the last 15 minute market transfer. Um, and then I have in the black lines here, the horizontal lines, that's showing um, the number of failure intervals during the, the month. Now, um, you might see uh, Northwestern Energy on this metric, uh, NWMT, which um, stands out a bit and was a bit of a special case for October. They were not able to offer incremental import capacity in the market during this period. Uh, so effectively, the import limit that would have been imposed because they failed the test was just at or above the regular total import capacity, effectively zero. Um, so in these cases, the, the test failure had no impact. Um, so just highlighting here a kind of a, a different category for that, um, where the imposed import limit um, didn't have any effect, um, but for the remainder, we're showing where that import limit comes from. And if go to the next metric, this is a updated metric from the previous report. Uh, previously, what we did was summarize the total import limits after a test failure, which included any base schedules, which are your bilateral inter-EIM schedules. 
the update now only shows the incremental uh, limit, so that's above the base schedules. Uh, so with the update, we can now review how much different areas can still dynamically import within the energy imbalance to market. So this metric uh, is for October. We're only showing areas that actually had an upward test failure during the month, um, and actually their import limits were um, were impacted. Um, but because this is a new perspective, we also have the same metric for the last month, September. Uh, in September, the ISO did fail the uh, resource efficiency evaluation in 10 or so intervals. Um, I want to make one note on this metric that KISO does not have any base scheduled ETSRs, those EIM transfers. Um, that said, you can, we can still look at this metric just to compare the dynamic import limits that can still be reached in the market following a, a test failure. And let's see, that was the same as before. So if we go to our the next section, looking at um, imbalance conformance adjustments and some of the changes we did there, we have a new metric showing the distribution of 15-minute market imbalance conformance entered by ISO operators. Um, so just to give a better sense of the full range in which um, these uh, balance conformance actions occur. And we have one other metric, new metric for balance conformance uh, here. Um, by hourly for October, we're showing the average and balance conformance adjustment, but as a percent of the area's load. Um, one note, I've excluded areas that didn't have a significant amount of imbalance conformance from this percent of load perspective just to reduce the clutter. Um, but still, as you can see here, that even as a percent of load, the systematic nature of the ISO bias, particularly in the uh, peak net load hours, still stands out a bit relative to the rest of EIM. And I think that was the last major changes in the October report, so let me pause here and see if there's um, any questions on the last two topics or any of the metric changes. Um, I do not see any questions in queue at this time. Okay, uh, thanks for that. So Wait, on our... On, just, just Go ahead. Oh, wait, they raised their hand. Okay, they're back. <laughs> All right, we have one person with a question. Um, Stuart, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate, excuse me, I was at a kid's volleyball game last night, so I've lost my voice. But but this kind of um, repeated pattern of load bias and seems to be you know, pretty problematic for the ISO. Wouldn't you agree from a DMM perspective? It's a, it's a consistent pattern over, you know, set of hours, um, and, and we, we we do need to address that as part of this um, stakeholder initiative. Yeah, it's something we're very mindful from a monitoring uh, perspective. Um, I agree that, um, yeah, everything surrounding that, including why it occurs, uh, should be left for the stakeholder process. Yeah, because if you look relative to the others, there's, there's obviously some noise in there and good reason, you know, to not account in my mind for load biasing for, you know, these EIM entities. You can see TID obviously had an issue um, around our ending five, but if you look at ISO, I mean, it's just repeating, um, you know, consistently load biasing. I, I, I don't believe that's the intent. So we need to come yeah, up with a bit better mechanism for ISO to address whatever issue is it's having rather than relying on load bison. Yeah, point, yeah, hey, point just, noted. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in again. Yeah, uh, Stuart and others, yeah, I'll just refer you back. Um, you know, we've shed a lot of light on this for the last, you know, probably four or five years. Um, yeah, and I, I think we've emphasized that um, 
this is they're clearly doing this to create ramp, more ramp in the evening yeah. hours and, and sometimes yeah. the morning. They're the all the, the I think every everybody would agree uh, it would be better to, for the ISO you know which does all it you know or strives to do everything through the market to do this through a some kind of a flexing flexible ramping product. The current product, however, the time frame is so short, you know, 15 minutes. It just doesn't, uh, you know, it's not the time frame isn't the, you know, one to two to three hour time frame that would be needed to really position ramp. So it's clear, you know, that's one recommendation is if you're going to do this through the market, you need to make have a different product or really revise the time frame of the flex ramp. The problem, though, you know, the alternative is for the ISO would be to take manual operations, which would be exceptional dispatches um, and out-of-market purchases uh, on the inner tides, for instance. And I think those are those are in effect the tools that other ISOs or other RTOs use or other balancing areas. Um, you know, prior to the hour head or the base schedules. Um, you know, because the other balancing areas aren't operating through a market. Um, or at least not, you know, up to the EIM, um, that they, in effect, have tools which are, uh, you know, to make bilateral purchases, man manual dispatches, um, to schedule their own units differently. The ISO doesn't have those tools, or if it does utilize those, you know, the equivalent is an out-of-market action, which stakeholders don't like easier, either. They don't like, um, you know, out-of-market purchases, um, in advance of the market or uh, exceptional dispatches. So that, that's kind of the problem is, you know, the alternative to the bias is a product that hasn't been developed and would have some lead time or reverting back to manual actions, which I don't think stakeholders um, would like either. So, yeah, I, I, but, yeah you know, again, never... again, great to bring up, you know, again, we want to just get this out there, the magnitude of it and um, look forward to, more discussion in the stakeholder process. Yeah, I really appreciate the reporting. It, it definitely is shedding quite some light on some of the issues, and uh, I would hate to see a solution that put, places a burden on operators or indeed taking manual actions. But if if timing is the issue in coming up with a product, I mean, uh, we are relying even for some of these tests on historical data to determine the needs. So maybe that's what we need to do. But um, I do appreciate the reporting. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, we are moving on to the next question in queue. Daniel, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hi, uh, Dan from Customized Energy Solutions again. I guess I'll just take the opportunity here to bookmark that uh, one point of curiosity for me has been with the uh, CAISO's um, change to the RUC high confidence forecast. Um, whether DMM has observed any changes to the uh, use of imbalance conformance in the real time as a result of doing that additional unit commitment in the in the day ahead or not, and um, if you're if you're still working on your uh, Q3 report, um, maybe that's uh, something we could look at in there. I'll I'll go ahead and take that uh, question. Thank you for that. We are still working on the Q3 report. Um, I'll just note that the high confidence forecast in REC is not new. There have been operator adjustments in REC going back quite some time, and we've reported on them. Um, I don't uh, – we will take a look at whether or not there's any um, correlation between changes in the uh, operator adjustments in REC and the imbalance conformance in the real-time market, although uh, from from memory, both have increased over the last several years. Okay, th thanks, Amelia. And I'd, um, yeah, I guess I shouldn't refer to it as new. It's just sort of a maybe discussed as a slightly different process for this summer than uh, what it was in the past. Um, but I'll look forward to that report. Thanks. All right, there are no additional questions in queue. Okay, yeah, let's move on here. Um, I'll say for our standard summary metrics, um, I don't plan on going over them in the presentation today, 
um, they're the same metrics and function um, from the first report that we put out, um, just showing the frequency of failures. Um, like we have shown before here, we are continuing to report on the impact of the uncertainty component being added to the bid range capacity test. Um, we're continuing to see a high frequency of bid range capacity test failures that are tied to the addition of this uh, new uncertainty. Um, and then if we go here, on the underlying data, we have released Excel files, which has the interval level data covering most of the metrics for July through September. Uh, the first has the components and outcomes for both the flexible ramping sufficiency test as well as the bid range capacity test. Um, you can see that the variables that we were including in these files. Um, the second file we've released has the imbalance conformance adjustments for each area, including the, the area load. And the third file we have out there right now has the EIM transfers and import limits following a resource efficiency evaluation failure. We're hoping to release uh, data covering the October report shortly, um, which would include even more uh, data files um, covering uncertainty and a few of the other things. Um, so until then, um, we encourage you to use this data for your own analysis. This can be found on, like Amelia said at the start, on DMM's website. Um, you can search under um, market monitoring reports and presentations, and then we have EIM RSC reports, and then the uh, the month that you're you're looking at. So as those additional files become available for October or for the later months, um, you can find them here. And let me. So that's all I have for today. Let me open it up again uh, for questions. See if there's anything on. Um, the underlying data, maybe anything we can do to make that data more useful for, for stakeholders. Um, and I'm also just open for any other general questions on, on any of the other topics in the presentation. I'll just answer a question that came up in the chat earlier. The uh, recordings from both this call and the first call, which came out after our July-August report, should be posted on our website with the Energy and Balanced Market Resource Efficiency Evaluation Report. All right, let me check to see if I see any questions in queue. I currently do not see any questions in queue. Okay, well, if there are any questions that come to mind after this call, you can shoot them to this address at dmm at kaiso.com um, and we'll take a look at that. Or if you put your questions directly in the uh, stakeholder process for the EIM research efficiency evaluation, um, it can be addressed that way as well. Um, and with that, um, I don't have anything else. Just wrap up by saying we really do appreciate your uh, feedback on the report. If there are metrics you would like to see and don't see, please do let us know. If there are metrics that you find confusing and have questions about, please let us know that as well. We can clarify things. Um, and if there's anything you would not like to see also, please let us know. All right, that concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.